So James, the, the interview with Scott today was really interesting. We've talked about chargebacks before, but we've sort of talked about it in perspective of here's a company that does chargeback management. I mean, what, what they're doing at uh, CNP mentors is, is, is different and unique. I yeah. think, don't you? It, well, it's like, it's like consulting really. I yeah. mean, they're, they're literally diving in and like working with the merchant. And I think what's interesting for our audience going into this interview is to understand that for many merchants, you say, Oh, this merchant, they only do 10,000 a month in volume. Right. But if their business is about to be shut down because of chargebacks, <laughs> how much would they pay to not lose their business? Right. Like, literally, if it's an online merchant, the only way they have to make money is electronic payments. And so uh, I think it's a really important topic. Um, you know, Scott kind of comes across as like he's the expert, like he's in the weeds. And so you, you he know, is you, in the weeds. <laughs> you you got to pay attention to this one and you got to yeah. you really should kind of take some notes along the way. It's like very good information. But he really dives down and says, like, this is why they're having chargebacks and this is why fraud is happening and so I thought that was really good um, and, and we're also if i can just interject yeah. i think what he's saying you know he's such an expert that you can go to him yes when you have the questions yeah, that's absolutely. really what it's about 100 percent. yeah absolutely i love it and it, you know has the has the iso referral program and all that so right um then questions from the field i continued my uh mini series from a couple of weeks ago talking about common objections today what do you say to a merchant that doesn't want to do cash discounting, dual pricing, or surcharging because my customers are going to be upset? My customers aren't going to want it. They won't accept it. Any of those, I'll tell you how I handle that. And then another hot topic in the Insiders Report, Patty, tell us about is, that. Is uh, gun sales and uh, Visa, MasterCard, and uh, American Express and Discover, I believe, also have put the brakes on efforts to create a special MCC yep. uh, for gun sales. So, um, Anyway, what do you say, James? Should we get going in our episode? Let's do it. Here we go. Hey, everybody. We are here today with Scott Adams, the CEO at CNP Mentors. How are you doing today, Scott? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing fantastic. So uh, we're going to talk today about chargebacks and fraud. Uh, and I really think that your model is very unique, Scott. So I'm excited to share that with our audience. But before we get to that, tell us how in the world you got into this crazy industry and kind of you know what your path was to dealing with fraud and chargebacks. Sure. So, you know, I think it's like a lot of people in the space, you know, I actually don't know how you got into it, but I didn't do it by choice. Um, I don't you know, think I very not. few people did. I think very few people did rather. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very true. I think maybe more the younger crowd now okay. maybe gets into it a little more by choice. But for sure. us, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years and I got into this. I was an engineer, a programmer back then. Okay. And it just, you know, I was figured I was just going to, you know, code and be happy and you know, write software, right. but really quickly learned a couple of things is that one, I was good at that, but I was maybe better at talking to real people too. Yeah. And yeah. I ended up getting through college, I did some consulting because uh, I was early in the computer stuff. And uh, a client I had then, as I graduated from college said, Hey, come and help me fix my tech. And it was this little tiny ebook company doing a few million bucks a year, maybe 3 million a year mm -hmm. selling word documents. And, you know, people laugh at that now, but that, right. That but at that time, doing. sure. And, you know, there were even PDFs, there were documents. And, uh, you know, I remember the guy offered me this job and I saw my mom and she's like, at first says, Oh, cool. You know, congratulations. Calls me back an hour later. Says, well, you know, your, your stepdad and I talked about it and we don't think it's a good idea because how can an internet company make much money? <laughs> and, you know, so I joined this company, horrible tech fix it all up. And it was these eBooks. The main one that sold well was doing background checks. Mm. But really what it was doing is it was telling you as a, just a person where on the internet to go to get data. Mm -hmm. And that data would let you do a background check. Right. But the engineer in me said, wait a minute, I can capture all this data programmatically. And it's basically free because of our sunshine laws. Right. And do background checks. And so we did that and then eventually turned it into a recurring product. And back then, that was almost also unheard of. And but the problem was is that all of a sudden we started losing merchant accounts, and I didn't even know what that was. I was an engineer, right? And so really, I had to either in my partners they were in their sixties and seventies, you know, they they lucked into this thing, the internet, right? Um, and they just had money, so started the company, and we get all these chargebacks, and so I lose merchant accounts left and right, and I kind of take over this process. And luckily got involved with some other, you know, early internet people, the, the Lytles, um, mm -hmm. who had, uh, you know, what now is, I guess, five serves e-commerce, but mm -hmm. Lytle and company. 
And they kind of taught me what, how this all works. But before that, I had no idea. Hmm. And so then after that, I, did, I got into this because I really, I had to either become an expert at this or lose the business. Right. And, you know, right. I chose to keep making money and growing this thing. And, sure. you know, and I fell in love with it though, because it, it's such, it's an area that is so important to every single business in the world. Yeah. But yet it's so unfair because nobody tells merchants how it works. Right. You get a merchant right. account. And then all of a sudden you get a phone call that you're doing it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yet te technically you were told. That, right. Right. Were you? Right. No. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been, that's been a problem, you know, almost from the beginning, you know, from the get go really. And part yeah. of it is not, it's not necessarily somebody's trying to pull, pull, pull a fast one. No, not really. No, it's more like they probably don't even understand what they're doing. Well, I think, I think to the other interesting thing, Scott, is that the whole concept of chargebacks and fraud, even in our industry where we're supposed to be the experts for most people, they look at it kind of like a black box a little bit, you know, of like, Oh, this mysterious thing happens. If you're getting chargebacks, well, you're just screwed. And yeah. in reality, it's actually totally like logical. <laughs> you know, there, there's like rules for this. It's not like a it it magical, is. you know, thing. Yeah, um, I, but it's you know, I had a friend rules. call me last night. She's like, you're, you know, you're miss, you're miss bank card stuff. You know, everything about bank cards. You know, I had this plumber come in, did all this work. They totally screwed everything up. What's my recourse? I said, well, you know, if they don't respond to you, you go to something called a chargeback. And I had, a, you know, I found myself explaining this all to somebody, you know, because yeah. even consumers don't even sometimes understand the rights that they have. Yeah. Well, so so let's do this, Scott. So let, let's define two things to start with, because, you know, we have people listening right now who are experts at this. We have people who have no idea what we're talking about right now. So um, yeah. for the second group, what exactly is a chargeback high level? And then what is an example of a of a fraudulent transaction or a, a fraud issue? Give us a, just a high level so we can understand the, sure. the concept. Well, so real quick, what I generally tell people like a chargeback from the consumer side is whenever you, you have a credit card, you get your statement or the text or your app and you see something you don't recognize. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe your card was stolen. So, you know, you're right as a consumer is to call the credit card company or your issuer in our world and tell them you don't recognize this. And then they will then basically give you your money back. And then they tell the merchant via the, the system and the merchant has, it does have a chance to respond to this. But in many cases, they, they just accept it. And so the merchant loses the money, consumer gets the money. And what most people don't know, even in this industry, is that there's rules and there's fines associated with this. And so if you have too many chargebacks as a merchant, you can lose your ability to process credit cards. Right. And it's not a, a fun or easy process. And so, you know, so that, that's a chargeback. It's just basically a dispute. And you know, there's like, like uh, he said, there's a lot of rules around it, but most of them aren't well communicated or well known. Yeah. Um, and then what about other? oh fraud? No. Yeah. Fraud. So what about friendly so, fraud? Right. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah. Which I know there's a lot of overlap, but give us a little context on that. Yeah. Well, so so now friendly fraud, and this is where actually I do maybe more work than anything, just because in my opinion, really, criminal fraud is you know, for example, you did get your card stolen as a consumer, right? Or it doesn't even have to be stolen per se anymore, because you can buy these on the internet in really right. even on the public web, but especially in the dark web. Mm -hmm. for not very much money. And so whatever the case, a charge goes through and it is fraudulent. You did not do the charge of the consumer. That's what I'll call criminal fraud. Now, the other side is what I call friendly fraud. And it, that's a really broad area, but how I like to define it is that it's 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 a, any kind of charge back that the consumer either actually knew they made the purchase and just wants to abuse the system and get their money back. Or it could be something where it's a mistake by the consumer. But as far as the merchant's concerned and how it's labeled is it's fraud. So it's a chargeback. But that's friendly because in as a, a merchant, you're trying to detect this fraud. Right. And the systems in place, for the most part, are around finding patterns of bad action. Hmm. And it's not going to detect that because you probably knew this consumer. Your system had seen them before. Hmm. They purchased from you before, maybe for years, never done a dispute. So why would you think it's fraud? So that's kind of more the friendly fraud. And, and a great example of that would be with video games, for example. Let's say you've got kids or grandkids. They're over at your house. They're playing a video game. And they want to buy some virtual currency. 
And you might say, hey, sure, son, or sure, you know, granddaughter, you can have some. So you maybe you enter your credit card and you don't realize that that card got saved in the system. And people always say, yeah, but you know, you have to type in the security code. But really, what what five-year-old even can't memorize the three-digit code? Right, right. So so then you know you said yes once, but then next week the kid buys again and again and again and runs up hundreds of dollars. And that's and not so this, uncommon. <laughs> no, it's not uncommon. Hmm. And so there's so I talk about two different things that happen here. So one, they overspent, you didn't give the permission, you call up to the to if if you're nice and understand the world, this world, you call the game company. And hopefully they'll give you a refund. They might not, but either way, technically you authorized it. But then, so then you do a charge back and it, now it's fraud. And the second thing that happens a lot, and I always like to kind of give this tip to, to merchants in general to fight friendly fraud. One of the first things to do is just, it could be confusion. You know, it could be this, right, the right. kid, it could be your spouse, significant other who you've shared your card with. They make or a purchase and then you pay the bill. And it also can be that you like check something off accidentally, right? I mean, I sure it happened to me recently. It's like I have a subscription to what? <laughs> yeah. Know? How did be, I ever get that? It can that? be that too. That's another yeah. great example. The subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Depending on the marketing, you don't always know you did a subscription. Right. So right. really any of these areas where you did it accidentally or you didn't recognize the charge, like if the descriptor's bad. Right. Because like a lot of times small businesses or all these businesses that jumped online during COVID. Mm -hmm. They probably got a merchant account at their local bank. It's the name on their credit on their uh, bank account. Right. Their, their LLC shows up in the credit card statement. Yep. Well, you don't know the name of that. It's probably some right. random name. Right. But you're going to charge that back. That's fraud. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, uh, Scott, a good example of that. We actually had this problem in our company uh, probably seven years ago. I rolled out instantquotetool.com, uh, which isn't even really a thing anymore, but we, we ended up uh, making a company out of it with Icewamp. But at the time, it was just a DBA of ccsalespro.com or CC Sales yeah. Pro LLC. Well, mm -hmm. we set it up through the NMI gateway and we started getting chargebacks. And we're like, what's going on? You know what I mean? We reach out to people and they would say, oh, oh, this is for the instant quote tool. Oh, okay. It was 29 bucks. It wasn't a big deal. But they were seeing CC Sales Pro and they're like, well, I didn't agree to pay them anything, which is true. Yeah. They, they, they signed up on a different website with a different brand name, but we didn't have our descriptor set up correctly. And so that's exactly. that so this, this is all friendly fraud. And yeah. there's so many different ways to combat it, but it's such yeah. a hard thing to combat mm -hmm. and the credit card companies don't see it any different. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so it causes so many problems. So let me, let me ask you this. So, you know, when you think about the impact that this has, right, whether it's the fraud, the, the chargebacks, all of this uh, kind of coming together, um, what is the impact on, um, you know, the merchant, right? So the uh, a merchant's getting this friendly fraud, it's happening too much. What's going to happen to them in terms of their rates, uh, in terms of their ability to process? Talk a little bit about kind of the consequences of this. Sure. So, you know, I think one of the, con the one of the most difficult consequences and, you know, kind of the extreme is losing a merchant account. Right. You know, most, it, there is some some wiggle room, but it, but the actual guideline the actual re regulation with Visa MasterCard is 0.9. So you can't have more than 0.9% chargebacks to transactions. Now, if this happens, generally, how it generally works is that your, your processor, your acquirer will contact you and say, hey, you're getting close. Maybe you're at 0.75. Mm. Um, but once you go over, they'll actually generally send you a, a note that's actually from Visa or MasterCard saying, hey, guess what? You're in a warning warning for a monitoring program. Now, this, these monitoring programs are really scary because they basically say, if you don't comply, you can be terminated. They also have fines. So, you know, financial impact is huge that like with the chargeback program, every there's kind of tiers and every so many months they bump the fines up. And so I, I believe nowadays at, I think month three or four with Visa, you start being charged $25 a chargeback. So, and that's on top of whatever your process was charging you. And by the, toward the end of the program, which is around 12 months, you're being charged a hundred bucks a chargeback. And so, you know, this has, really big consequences. Now on the fraud side, because there's another program that monitors just fraud disputes, it's it's flat fees, but it starts at 10 grand. It can get up into six figures. Wow. By the, yeah. by the 12 yeah. months. And then what what I think what many people forget to even think about, and I've you know personally dealt with this as I described earlier, is the impact on the people dealing with it. Like especially a small business, you know, it's not the fraud team. There's no right. fraud team. It's right. the CEO. 
Like right. I was running this company and most of my brain power was going to fixing this problem, not hmm. growing our business, not marketing, not right. any of the things a CEO should be doing. Hmm. You know, so there's there's huge opportunity cost that goes into that. So let's let's switch gears just a little bit, um, if you don't mind. Sure. Scott, I'd like to kind of look at the impact on ISOs and agents. You know, they're trying to get deals done. You know, how do these issues, you know, chargeback issues impact that process? Sure. Well, so there's a, a first, there's the one similar to the merchant, right? You know, they're seeing the chargeback rates go up and, you know, they acquire, they have a chargeback rate they have to stay under too. So right. your, your portfolio as an ISO has to keep a low chargeback rate as well. And so you really almost have the exact same problems. And yeah, and a lot of, a lot of times you can pass that cost on to the, to your merchants, but they're going to leave. They're going to lose their businesses. Right. They're going to go out of business or they're going to, going to, you know, be getting high and think, you know what, I'll just jump ship yeah. Mm -hmm. or I get in trouble. I'll go somewhere else. Right. And so you'll lose, lose business. And depending on how you, how things work, you know, sometimes they'll get another mid with you, but does that actually help you? And it, I, right. It's my opinion, we need to fix the markets. We don't right, need right. to let them play games with jumping mids. And there's, you can fix them. Like even the, the worst offenders with education and the right tools and systems and knowledge, they can run those businesses at a lower chargeback rate. So, so let's move to that and see, you know, can you kind of drill down in ter terms of what exactly can be done? You know, when you come in contact with a merchant like this that has these kind of issues, what are you as the agent or the ISO going to do in order to the ass assess the problem and create a game plan? Sure. So, you know, it, it's highly dependent on what's going on, but I always look at like kind of what's the low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times, one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about in this industry is that, and I like to remind merchants that it's, it's the whole process. It's, it's the whole ecosystem. And so, you know, how do you get a sale, right? You get a sale as a merchant by attracting customers, right? So you get your customers to come into what a lot of people call the funnel, to look at your marketing funnel. And what I think a big mistake a lot of merchants make is over promising on the top of the funnel and mm -hmm. under, under delivering at the back end of the funnel. And okay. so if these, if, if your messaging throughout the whole process doesn't line up, you know, any point there's breakage, then you're going to have chargebacks. Um, you know, like I've got one merchant right now, for example, that's, uh, you know, direct to consumer internet marketer, you know, they tend to push the line a bit. And a lot of what happens with him is that like, you know, he'll set things up, his engineers set up, up his product and his sales process. He drives traffic and then something breaks, but there's not much monitoring around this. So if any, Mm. And so one of the things that I do as a, as a consultant and I, and, you know, really an ISOR agent could do this too, would be mystery shop, you know, run through the whole process without mm. the, them knowing that it's you. So they don't, you know, hand massage things and see what happens. Like I almost always find problems. I find, okay, I didn't get that email. I didn't get the, you know, the login to the account. My login doesn't work. So generally in a scene where there's breakage in the process and the funnel tends to be be a really good clue or clues to how things work. Mm. Um, I also go through the, go through the refund process um, and support process. Mm. Like people often forget that mm. and because same thing. Like I actually, I, I can't say who, but I work with a uh, top name brand. Everyone would know. And, and I place an order and then I go to, to get a refund and literally both like their decision support, you know, AI chat told me to do a chargeback. It said, hey, well, just contact your bank if you want a refund. Wow. Really, guys? How about a mistake? <laughs> you know, yeah, and then yeah, I talked yeah. to a live person. Same thing. They, were, they told me to contact my bank. And, mm. you know, okay. And I said, then I then I always tell the, mer the merchant, okay, if you're doing this check, now actually say the word chargeback, see what happens. And basically, same thing. Oh, you got to talk, talk to your bank about that. Okay. But that doesn't help you, merchant. Right. You know, this is right. not what you want. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I was, I would tell them to look at those things, look at your descriptor, make sure those are right. lined up because right. most, most ISOs I've ever dealt with don't understand that. You right. know, they'll put in just the company name and they'll fight me when I tell them, no, I want you to put this product name. Right. Or better yet, use soft descriptors. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, but a lot of them can't easily technologically. Right. And so I say, you know, if you can't do it, use your most common product. Um, so there's so many things we can do. And then, you know, of course, like this is where, you know, my company comes in is that we help merchants do all these things and uh, make right. sure that both, you know, on the compliance side and the marketing side, and then digging down into the product, you know, where yeah. the products working. And then finally into our, um, you know, the payment systems, how they work. And, uh, you know, then kind of finally, you've got the things like, you know, Visa Compelling Evidence 3 coming out. And, you know, the alert systems, which can drastically reduce chargebacks, but they're really expensive. Mm -hmm. They don't actually solve the problem. Right, right. So how, I'm curious, like, <clears throat> when you describe that process, like, how standardized is this? In other words, you know, when you work with uh, different businesses, is it like, you know, they, there's just a million different random issues they could have and you got to find it? Or is it kind of like, oh, it's always one of these three things? You know what I mean? Like, where, where does it fall in that? So what, what I generally tell merchants is that it's it's generally, there's generally a, at least one of, there's not like, say, 10 things that yeah. are causing your chargeback problem. It, and it's not always the same 10. Um, I say. But yeah. oftentimes it is at least the, the, the few, it's kind of the stuff I just described. Right. will probably be a quarter or more of your problem. And that's what you're talking about, that low-hanging fruit. It's like, yeah, you can, you, can run, you can run through the process and very quickly identify, we've got X problem, that's going to cut by a fourth or a half maybe of your chargebacks. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Then then you get into more of the nitty gritty and, you know, more of a custom approach for them to figure out how to get rid of, you know, or minimize the rest is what you're saying. Exactly. And a lot of times it's the, those may be easy things to identify, right? but they can be difficult to solve. Sure. Because, you know, like, like for example, uh, another merchant I worked with, they're also D to C and they had the same kind of problem where a lot of their, the pre-sales process was not congruent with the post. Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is that like a lot of times, unfortunately in that industry, it's just kind of how it is. And that's, right. and unfortunately that's what I was told. Like I said, okay, guys, here's, look, here's what you're telling people you're selling. Here's what you're delivering. Right. And I, so I got the owner on the phone and I got, and he got his, his tech guy on the phone and the tech guy, literally everything I said, yeah, but that's how everybody does it. I right. said, well, guys, and that's why everybody's in trouble. Right. So right. I guarantee you, we can fix this if you listen to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, I don't have that client anymore, really, because they don't listen and they won't listen. All right. They'll probably go out of business. All right. So that, that's a really good segue into my next question. So um, how successful are you at this? In other words, um, are there, are there still a lot of companies that'll come to you where you're just like, you know, there's nothing we can do here, or is it pretty much like, Hey, you know, we could fix the problem if you're going to listen and you're going to work with me. Like what's the success rate? You know, I don't think I've ever had a merchant that I've not been successful with, but with that caveat, they have to be willing to change. Right. And, but, but to be clear, I, you know, like I said, I started out as a merchant and right. you know, we didn't talk about my other kind of steps to, to get here, but basically most of those steps we're either building a, a system, a, basically filling a gap I saw in the, in the industry, and either sure. getting absorbed or getting bought by by a company. Right. Um, and mo many of those those steps, the two biggest ones were in, in video game companies um, where I got absorbed to solve these problems. Right. And how it you know, generally works, it's like, if, if you're willing to listen, we can fix it, we can change. But sure. you have to change. And in doing that, because I've always been a merchant, like I'm not right. somebody that doesn't understand. I've been a CEO. I've sure. run run merchant businesses before. Right. I've run big components of other, of, you know, businesses I've been part of. And I can't not think like a merchant. Right. It's just, I see myself as a merchant and it drives me nuts when companies don't. And right. the thing is, is like, you can do it the hard way or the easy way. If you do it the hard way, then, you know, you spend a bunch of money and you drop your conversion rates. Right. But why would I want that as a merchant? Right. So that's not how I approach it. I look at it. Okay. How much trouble are you in? So like, are you going right. to be shut down tomorrow? Is right. your, you know, did I have to call your acquirer and say, Hey guys, you know, you know me, I'm here. Give them another right. month or two before you put them on the TMF before you terminate right. them. Mm -hmm. And then the acquirer say, okay, yeah, awesome. You're here. You got it. Just right. show me progress. Right. Right. Um, right. You know? And so, in those cases, if it's got to be fast progress, it's going to cost you more because, and not as much, I'm not talking about fees. I'm talking about the cost of, of doing that business, changing business. Right. But if you, right. if you catch it a little bit earlier, 
right. then we can take a time. softer approach. Right. In that case, you don't lose money. You actually end up making more because we improve the conversion process. We improve the your customer right. success and the happiness of your customers. Right. Right. You know, so in that case, if people want to actually do the work, then I don't think I've ever failed. Hmm. This, That's the, cool. The system, you know, the like you guys said, it's like there's a lot of unknowns here to the general public and, and to many merchants, but it's just a set of rules. Right. And we just have to play play by them. Right. You're you're yeah. a game player. The, the merchants have to remember they're a game player, not a rule maker. So yep. right. they, they have right. to understand That's the rules. Sometimes difficult, but it is. <laughs> it is. A lot of times people want to be the rule maker, but they're not. And they they well, like you said earlier, oh, this is how everybody does it. No, you're not the rule maker. You're a game player. You're playing in a game, and somebody mm -hmm. else is making the rules, and you're breaking the rules. Right. Exactly. Right. And the rules so, have been because set. everybody else is breaking the rules doesn't mean you can break the rules. <laughs> Just right. like I'm always telling my kids. <laughs> like yeah, my mom right, yeah. used to tell me. <laughs> So one last question, and then I want to get into a little more specifics of what CNP Mentors actually does and how you work with ISOs. But before we get to that, really quickly, give us three or four examples. Are there some certain verticals, uh, business types that you find that are maybe even pretty straightforward to work with? They tend to have a pretty well-defined set of issues that are consistent that you can fix pretty quickly. Where, where, where do you have a lot of success? So we've had it really kind of all over the place, but you know, one of the areas that I've done a lot of work with is, uh, is video games and sure. just the kind of everything that plays in that ecosystem. Sure. You know, one, I've had a lot of experience with it. You know, I, I worked at Riot Games and I did all sure. this for them. Yeah, sure. Um, and, you know, there are billions of players. Right. And like, so games, it's it's a sort of a different mindset, but right. it's still the same processes. Hmm. And, you know, they tend to have a couple problems. They have, one is that they're, they're low barrier to entry, you know, and they want to make it easy. They want players to come in right. as quickly and easily as possible. Right. And so they, they, they don't, they don't want to add any friction or barriers or anything to putting a card exactly. information on file, but then that can create some issues. Exactly. And so they leave these gaping holes. And then because the cost is low, you know, you might be able to get into a game for five bucks. That means that the criminal fraud people are there and right. they're testing cards. Right. Yeah. That's actually pretty easy to stop. Mm. But if they don't, generally they don't know because, you know, right. they're, they're making a game. They don't care about mm. payments. Interesting. Um, the second issue they tend to have is uh, is friendly fraud, and like we talked about earlier, you know, right? It, it, right. Somebody else is using the card. Somebody it. used their mom's or their grandma's. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny when you said that earlier because my um, um, my brother in law, his son, like a couple of years ago, uh, did this, and you know, there was a card on file. Didn't he didn't fully grasp what was going on? Spent four hundred bucks on this video, oh, yeah. game. <laughs> yeah. you know, and his dad's like, "What is going? What is this?" You know, I had a friend uh, that was very similar, and it was yeah. like, "Wait a minute, where did this charge come from?" And yeah. she's reading it off to me. I'm like, uh, "Go ask your son about his video games." <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so Scott, I, let's let's uh, you know, let's transition here into your partnership and kind of what you do. So, you work with these merchants. Give us the high level kind of elevator pitch of like, how does this work? How do you make money? And then by extension, how do you partner with ISOs and agents in, in this process? Sure. So, you know, kind of our, our core offer, our core competency is what I've been describing. It is getting people's payments and fraud ecosystem tuned up. And, you know, if you're in trouble, getting you out of trouble quickly and without losing your business. Right. Um, and also what we do a lot of too is on the, on the other side. And I actually like this more and more is to work with younger companies that aren't in trouble and maybe they've not even went live mm -hmm. and getting them set up right, you know, yeah. in the first place so they don't get in trouble, giving them some education, giving right. them some training and making sure that they're with, and this is so important to everybody out there, making sure they're with a really good processor and processors and other vendors that want to know them and help them and be a partner, not right. just a vendor because mm -hmm. relationships are everything um, in this industry. And I so think in that both, respect, you kind of you kind of are a go between. Yeah, and so you know, so I've been doing this so long that I'm able to, and you know, I know these vendors. I know, you know, I know a lot of ISOs. I know a lot of direct, you know, the the top vendors um, in the, in the space. And so, generally, I can get you good pricing, and I can get get you those relationships you need to grow your business, hmm. and and then be long, ideally, stay around for the ride in right. you know, some capacity, just that at the least. So that almost as like a coach, so that, you know, if you need me, just give me a call or flip side, even if I'm, I've had this happen a lot, actually, even if I'm not still being paid by the merchant, just because I got things going for him and the people know me that are involved, I've had it happen where, you know, merchants getting in trouble, the, the processor will just call, they'll call me and they'll say, Hey, you know, they're, you're, one of your merchants have this issue. 
And I said, okay, hold on. I'm not actually working with them anymore. So don't tell me something you shouldn't tell me. They said, okay, we'll just call them. And so I call them up and say, hey, I heard this. And yeah. they said, okay, well, you have my permission. Talk to them. And then <laughs> right. they'll tell me, okay, so it's, you know, the rates are rapidly increasing or they're well over the threshold. We're going to have to shut them down soon if someone doesn't help them. Right. And then you know, I'll jump in and fix that. And that's right. so valuable because once, once I've been involved, I just don't, I can't stop. I still care. Right. Um, right. You know, so that, that happens a lot. And that's kind of, those are kind of the big things and just, just helping merchants navigate this whole ecosystem. And, uh, and also just to clarify. So if, it, for our audience, ISOs and agents, <clears throat> when they run into this situation, they have a merchant that's got this problem that, you know, they're, they're going to be shut down or they're trying to sign up a merchant that they can't because of this chargeback issue. Yep. They can then, I would assume, reach out to you. Mm -hmm. Right. And kind of refer that merchant over to you. Is that, is that a kind of a channel that you, yeah. that you look to? Definitely. Definitely. And then, you know, and on the flip side, I kind of return the favor as well is that once I know you and, you know, I, I work with a number of different ISOs and agents that once I know them, I know what you're good at. Right. Sure. Right? Right. You know, it, sure. And you all can... have merchant accounts. Right. And that's kind of commodity, but right. each agent has their own skill set. Like I've got one, one uh, ISO that I work with a lot that's in, they really understand video games and they understand kind of a, quasi gambling nature of some things and right they can get those through whereas one with no experience in that can't right or i've got others that are good at nutraceutical i've got others that are good at you know so yeah you know, that's a good thing then yeah and then like you said I, and that's something else i help a lot with agents and isos is that you know if you you're trying to onboard a merchant and they've got chargeback problems right then it really doesn't take long to get those rates down if they know what to do mm. so i'll jump in help that merchant fix their problems. And sometimes the banks will take them because I'm involved. Right. Depending on who the, who the bank is that they've worked with before, they, they know that I'll fix it and won't let them get in trouble again. Yeah. Right. Good stuff. So for those in our audience who want to learn more, maybe they have a merchant they're thinking of right now, or they just want to kind of make that connection, learn more about what you do. Where would you send them to learn more and connect with you, Scott? Uh, probably the best place is, uh, is Scott at cmpmentors.com. Um, or if it's easier to remember, it uh, also works if you just could do scott at scotteadams.com. Cool. Awesome. And CNP Mentors is like card not present. <clears throat> so C in the letter N, cnpmentors.com. Uh, scott, thank you so much for taking the time to share this with us. Uh, a lot of interesting information. Some of it I'd never heard before. I think it's really cool. I think a lot of our audience is going to, you know, write this down, keep it in mind of like next time they run into this merchant to reach out. So thank you for sharing that information. I really appreciate it. Yes, Awesome. Thanks, thanks, a, lot. thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Patty, today I want to talk about how to actually get a payment processing statement from a merchant using ISOAMP. Okay. okay. So ISOAMP is the sponsor of this episode. Right. And one of the one of the features I hardly ever talk about that's actually really popular is our marketing campaigns. So okay. a marketing campaign, you can actually go into the system. It's very easy. Anybody could do it. You don't have to have a technical expertise. But you go in, create a new marketing campaign, and you can decide if that's going to be what's what we call an upload marketing campaign or an instant uh, marketing campaign. So an instant one is where you have a unique URL link. Right. They also give you an iframe that you can just put on your website. Uh -huh. um, and you can share that on social media, in your email signature, wherever you want. And the merchant would come, if it's an instant one, they're gonna put a, some basic information in, their volume, number of right. transactions, uh, their amount they're paying, and it's gonna just instantly give them an estimate, right? Here's what we could save you roughly. But then we have another option now, which is the upload campaign where it'll ask them their business type and then give them a screen to upload their statement. And right now, our turnaround time on statements that are not fully automated, not instant, our turnaround time is 11 minutes on average. Wow. So to give you an idea of how this might work, right? Let's say that you post on Facebook. Hey, for anybody that's running a business out there and my Facebook friends, you know, um, I, I'm doing free statement analysis now for any of my friends. Click this link and upload your recent payment processing statement. Oh, very right? cool. Well, when they click that link, they're going to be prompted to put their name, phone number, and email in there, or you can customize it. You can actually have whatever field you sure. want and say if they're required or not. But, but anyway, they get past that first screen. It's an upload screen. They upload their statement. You get an email that says, so-and-so just uploaded a statement. Then, you know, one, two, three, 11 minutes later, whatever it is, you're going to get a second email from ISOAMP that says this analysis is complete and ready for review. Now, we don't send it automatically back to the merchant. We want to go to you. Yeah, right. Because you okay. want to log in, adjust the pricing, pick out your proposal template. And now you reach back out. Hey, thanks for uploading your statement. I already did the analysis for you. And they're like, my goodness, this person's so fast. That or amazing. is so cool, man. That right? is so cool. 
Yeah. And so you can use that. One last thing I'll mention for the larger companies that might be listening in or the marketing experts, we do have uh, within the system, this is one of my favorite things. We have a fully custom version where we literally give you a blank box with the smart fields for the form. Uh -huh. And then you can use HTML and CSS to build your own landing page. Um, we have several clients using it. So if you're going to do an actual like serious paid Facebook or Instagram advertising campaign or LinkedIn or something, right. you know, you want to drive that to like a high converting landing page. Right. You can build all that within our system, or you can grab the form and you can put it into your system. So we have a lot of functionality there, not to mention, of course, the API where you can do whatever you want, but yeah. we got a lot of functionality with the marketing campaign. So if you're interested in that, head over to getisoamp.com. It's G-E-T-I-S-O-A-M-P.com. And now reach out to my team for a demo. We'd love to show you what it looks like. So Patty, I'm kind of continuing a series. I've kind of started, stopped a little bit with it, but we're talking about common objections right. uh, that I'm hearing from agents. And, right. and um, before, I think our last week we did something on integration, perhaps it was. Yeah, it was where, yeah. you know, what do I do if they're already integrated with uh, payment processing? And, and in fact, by the time I think, you know, we recorded them that way, I don't think they're going to go out that way. Right. But anyway, okay. sometime in the last few weeks, you heard that one. This week, we're going to talk about um, what to do when they are, uh, you know, they they you were trying to sell dual pricing and they don't want to upset their customers. So this was the next most common one because, you know, no secret here, uh, a lot of our audience is selling some kind of surcharging, cash discounting, dual pricing, uh, some kind of differential price point. And um, I've had a lot of experience dealing with this one. And so I want to talk about a couple of things. So first of all, the key to overcoming this objection, and you'll hear this theme a lot through this kind of mini series, is that we want to deal with the objection before it happens. Right. Um, you know, trying to convince someone that they're wrong is very, very difficult, especially in a sales situation versus convincing them that you're right before they say that you're wrong. Right. <laughs> right. So once they say, oh, that wouldn't work for us, our customers wouldn't go for that. It's now going to be very challenging for you to convince them that they are going to be okay with it. I'll talk about how to do that in a minute. What's a lot easier is that you deal with it right off the bat. So when you're selling dual pricing, cash discounting, surcharging, you already know that that's going to be a big objection. I mean, that's like the only objection really, right? So right. a couple of things you can do to deal with it. The first thing is stop presenting it like it is the the new, cool, bleeding edge, innovative thing to do. Yeah. Um, it is not, first of all. And secondly- it's been around it for decades. Yeah, it doesn't work good to sell it that way. Instead, position it as what fuel stations have been doing for decades. As you just mentioned, you know, that's what you want to do. So you say, you know, um, it was, it was really funny. I had a really interesting situation, Patty, uh, my sister, Hannah, um, she is a writer. And so she's like a freelance writer. And I was asking her to help out with some blogs that we were doing for CC storage, one of my software companies. And we have this, you know, differential pricing on the website. We actually have three because it's cash, uh, ACH and then card. So we were on this, uh, zoom and, uh, with the guy that runs that company for me, and we were talking about it and she's like, so what, how does this differential pricing, like, what is that? How does that work? And I said, and you know, she's never heard of it before. And I said, well, Hannah, I said, have you ever been to a fuel station where they had a cash price and a card price? And she's like, yeah. And I said, it's that. And she's like, oh, okay. Right. That's it. That's all the explanation. Right. That, that, so that's all you have to do. do. Right. Yeah. So, you know, most merchants have experienced that. So leverage that and say, you know, they say, well, what is it? How does it work? Don't start by saying, well, what we do is we take your current price and we make that the cash price. Then we increase that by 4%. We make that the card price. Then we collect TMI. the difference. Like, oh, uh, instead, you just have to very quickly say, have you ever been to a gas station or fuel station where they had a cash price and a card price? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, so use that at the beginning, right? Then as you get a little further into the pitch, you can also mention again and say, one of the great things about this program is that pretty much every single one of your customers has been to a fuel station that had a cash and a card price where they used their card and paid a little bit extra for that convenience. So right. they're already conditioned behaviorally to accept this practice. And that's the great thing about it is you already know that your customers are willing to accept this model. Right, right. If I say you already know that your customers are willing to accept this model, it makes it very difficult for them to then say, oh, I don't think they will accept it. Now, some right. will. They'll still say that, but very few. Now, if you get yourself in the unfortunate situation where they give you the actual objection, which does happen often because they already kind of know where you're going with it. And you say, oh, I can eliminate your processing fees. And then they say, oh, I've heard of those programs where you pass it on to the customer. I don't want that. You know, so they, they kind of get ahead of you before you can get ahead of that. Right, right. Right. Um, when that happens, what I recommend that you do is just lower the commitment level that's necessary to move forward. 
right? And so you say to them, you know, okay, let me let me say this. And first of all, you know, you could be right. You know, this this program is not the right fit for every business. In fact, what we found is, you know, roughly one out of every 25 businesses that signs up for this program, they actually do end up eventually wanting to go back to traditional pricing. Mm -hmm. Now, you might be that one business out of 25 where it's a, where it's not the right fit for you, right? But here's what mm -hmm. I would tell you, okay? Worst case scenario is we try it out and you are that one out of 25. And for whatever reason, usually something about the implementation just doesn't feel right to you for your culture, whatever it might be, you may be that one out of 25. And if that happens, guess what? We're just going to switch you back to traditional pricing. Right. We're still going to save you money because I really would appreciate you giving me a shot. So I'm going to give you really, really good pricing on traditional so that if we do have to switch you back to that, we're going to save you. It's going to be basically at cost or pretty close to it so that we can save you a ton of money. But you have a 24 out of 25 chance that you're not going to be that business. And instead, you're going to wipe out all of your processing fees. So if I'm willing to like not lock you in at all and just give you a chance to try this program for 30 days, 60 days, for three days, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, are you at least willing to give me a shot at trying to save you this money? What do you think? Does that make sense? Right, so you you can overcome it that way by lowering the bars. Yeah. But notice how the first thing I did was I agreed with them, right? Yeah, right. You could be right. You could be that one out of 25, right? So it's kind of ridiculous, right? You could be that one out of 25. But, I, but I'm agreeing. I'm not disagreeing with them. I'm just saying the odds are you're wrong, but I'm not going to say it that way. I'm going right. to say it's you're... possible that you're right. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And people like that a lot better. So oh, there yeah. you go. That's how I overcome one of the most popular uh, common objections around these programs. Excellent. Thanks, James. Well, James, you may recall my reporting on a decision by the credit card companies probably about a month or two ago that they were going to start assigning a unique merchant category code for gun sellers. Yep, I was just talking to Reuters about this uh, yesterday, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. And, uh, you know, this followed a recommendation from the International Association for Standards, Standardization, I believe it is. Well, you know, gunshot owners have never had their own MCC. Instead, they were usually lumped in with specialty shops. Now it looks like it's going to stay that way because the card brands have put the brakes on working on a new MCC. Yep. Seems some Republican lawmakers in several states have introduced bills to prohibit or restrict the creation of these new codes. Um, it's been legislation's been introduced in at least five states that would maintain the status quo: Florida, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Texas, and West Virginia. Uh, legislation in three of those states, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and West Virginia, has already made it through the first round of voting. So I think you know Mastercard and Visa saw the writing on the wall. I mean, how can you do that even if you only have right. one state, right? Right. Well, and I, and I think for them, it's like, it's a fight that they don't really care they about. They don't they, really want to be in this fight. They, they never cared about this in, in the, to begin. It was like, a, they everybody made such a big deal about it. I was talking to this reporter from Reuters about it. because it's like, everybody made such a big deal out of it. And it really wasn't that big of a it's deal. It's not that big a deal. That's and, and the for way the card I feel brands about are like, it. The card brands are like, oh, we have to use political capital to do this? No, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I know, you know, exactly, right? You know, I mean, sure, you know, there's, you know, it's going to create, a, it would have created a little bit of confusion, okay? Sure. But I think this is what 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 kind of gets me about the, the code is that it really had nothing to do with guns. Right. It had nothing to do with gun control. I right. mean, we have MCCs for what? Beauty parlors and, right. you know, Right. Drug stores and, yeah. you know, a lot of different things, you know, why not gun shops? But clearly this is one of those issues that is just way too hot for the card companies to want to get yeah. involved with. Frankly, I well, don't blame them. And, you know, I'll tell you something, Patty, that was interesting to me. I, I did come up with uh, an interesting scenario, not one that really is being talked about, but it's, it's, it's really, in my opinion, the only real risk in all this. And, you know, when you think about... There's two reasons that a that a uh, you know sponsor bank will not allow you to board a merchant account, right? Right. You have financial risk, and you have reputational reputational risk. risk. Now look at what happened with uh, a lot of stores who have decided not to carry guns, not because they weren't making money from the sale of firearms, but no. because they didn't want their brand associated with this particular issue. Right. Wasn't like Walmart? I think stopped for a while there. Right. Walmart or... stopped for a while. Uh, Dicks. Square right. goods, uh, which they were a huge, like major yeah. firearms reseller, and they stopped. So I think there is a legitimate concern here 
that you could say in the same way that, you know, maybe um, cannabis dispensaries, adult entertainment, um, you know, which that one's a bad example because they, you know, they actually do have chargeback things. But, you know, some of these business types where it's not really a financial risk, people just don't want to be involved in it. Right. right? You know, strip I think your cannabis that. stuff would be a perfect example of that. Yes, exactly. You yeah. know, it is possible. Now, again, I don't see it as being a game over issue because even if some banks had a reputational issue, others would be like embracing it. So I don't see it as that big of a deal. But I do think it's possible that, you know, firearms dealers could wind up in a situation where it was harder to get a merchant account because yeah. there was more demand than supply. Yeah. Their rates for accepting payments would go up as a result. Yeah. Um, and, the, and it could end up being restricted from a, from a free market perspective. So right. that to me is actually the, the only real legitimate concern here. I can't imagine any other scenario other than legislation that would go in the other direction. But right. I think that's really unlikely. It, 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 I guess two things. One is it does open the door to legislation could be created that would that would restrict because now you you actually have the data to restrict it but to me you don't even need that you know you can and, restrict and even it anyway. the data itself it's not like the data is going to go down to the product level right exactly right right so yeah i mean so. it just you could go into a gun store and you could buy some crazy hunting outfit right i mean right i mean right. i've been to dicks i've been to a couple you know i Right. I have to admit, I'm not a gun person, but I yeah. every I have gone into a couple of big stores like Cabela's, just walked up to the gun counter just to see what does it yeah. look like, you right. know? Right. And, and you'll get a kick out of this. I said to the guy, said to the guy, he's like, well, how can I help you? I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just wondering about what a shotgun, you know, some for somebody my my size would look like. And he <laughs> gave me a pink one. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, I live in central Pennsylvania, and so I am the only person who's not a big gun enthusiast in my area. Not, Same I, and where looks, I am. I love going to the range. Well, I'll go with family, and we'll go to the range, and and you know, I'll, I'll it's great. You know what I mean? But I'm just not not my thing. But um, but anyway, but yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely think a lot more is made out of it than than needs to be. And I think, I think the, car, so the car brands were like, forget this, we're out. We're here. not gonna <laughs> get you know, we're not gonna get caught up in this morass, and you can't yeah. really blame them. Yeah, I so. agree. Cool. Well, let us know if anything changes on that, Patty, but that's sure a good hot story will, for sure. Yeah.